Hello. Uh, as I said, my name is Trevor Urban. I uh, am busy doing inspections. I do about uh, six inspections a quarter, and I'm with Region 7, which is the four states of Kansas, Iowa, Nebraska, and Missouri. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I looked online to see where we ranked in cattle cattle on feed were second, third, and fourth with uh, Nebraska, Kansas, and Iowa. And of course, Iowa is number first is number one in pork production. So uh, a lot of things going on here in Region 7. A lot of the uh, things when I go out and look at a facility, you know, the state has in our, in our region, all four states have a, a CAFO program. And so we work closely with the states. And uh, if you're permitted, I'm going out there with your state permit, and that's basically your Bible that I'm looking at to what you have to follow. If you're not a permitted facility, then I'm simply looking for uh, uh, potential to discharge and, and pathways or discharges to the water of the U.S. And what I see out there uh, with what I'm looking for out there is make sure that all the processed wastewaters are controlled and managed per the permit, if, if you've got one and that you're maintaining the facility uh, to prevent discharges. You're not putting stuff where it shouldn't be. You're not uh, using some bad um, uh, management practices that uh, would increase your possibility to discharge. Uh, lots of times what I will find is that the feedstock storage area or the composting areas uh, haven't been included in the permit or, or aren't being, uh, best management practices aren't being followed and, and they're resulting in a discharge or the potential to discharge and a lot of times just uh, uh, doing some good housekeeping around the facility uh, or some uh, lagoon maintenance will take care of that kind of stuff. When it comes to lagoon maintenance, uh, like was said previously, I'll take a look at your records first. Uh, I also do call ahead of time. Uh, a lot of times the states don't because they're out in the area, they have their geographic area, and they'll just drop by because they're, they're out in that area. I, I mainly call to make sure that somebody or the right person will be there when I get there. I also call the, the state or, or uh, in poultry the, the company vet to make sure there isn't any disease outbreaks. And, and if you have a bi biosecurity program, I'll follow it. If not, I'll use the Region 7 biosecurity program. Uh, a lot of times uh, I'll, I will focus on you know, you know, your storage capacity, your management of your lagoons, your feedstock storage area, uh, where, where do you store your bedding, um, are your sediment basins or your lagoons full of uh, manure and sediment, does uh, a runoff from the production area all go to a c control, or, and do you divert uh, clean water? I've got some photos here that will show the importance of diverting clean water and not having to uh, uh, deal with it as process water once it comes in contact with the rest of the facility. Uh, I also focus on uh, equipment maintenance to, you know, your equipment has to work. You can do uh, with the nutrient management plan, you got your soil analysis, you've got your effluent of your pond or your, or your solids analysis, but if your equipment isn't calibrated and, or it's not functioning correctly, then you're, you don't know if you're applying in agronomic rates. Uh, where do you store your uh, uh, mortality? How do you store? Do you have rendering? Do you uh, do composting? That kind of stuff. A lot of these things uh, get put by the way because they're not actually making you money, and, and or they're or they're not covered in the permit because they were overlooked. And those are I'm looking for everything to be controlled. You always want to make sure you have adequate storage capacity. You know whether you have a litter stacking shed or or you have a concrete containment or, or a lagoon. Uh, if you're composting, you know, you don't, you, your composting bins can only hold so much. You gotta be con concerned about track out and, and it's always good to have them covered if possible, but a lot of times you don't and it's just, you know, if, if and I got a photo farther on down here that, that shows even though they're built sloping back into the, the confinement area there into the bin, it still finds a way out. Next photo doesn't want to come up real quick. Uh, lagoon maintenance, you know, each state has their own set of regulations on, on what they want to do with lagoon maintenance. And certainly you can't have large trees growing out of it. And you can't, uh, you've got minimum and maximum levels. You've got start pump levels. Um, 
and you want to make sure that you're not driving on the top of them and tearing them down, especially when they're wet. And right now, my uh, photographs aren't moving forward, so that's why the... We'll work on that, Trevor. Okay. Well, when it comes up, I'll just keep going here. I've got mine printed out, and we'll flip through them pretty quick to keep caught up. Oh, there we go. As you can see, this one here is, is at the top and ready to, to overtop. A lot of times when you have chronic rain events, you can't apply because it's too wet, but yet you don't want to lose your structure. So I recommend you get with your state because, like I said, the states uh, usually have the programs and they're your first line of defense and they're going to recommend to you what you should do. You know, nobody's talked about thus far about the permit being a shield. If you're operating your facility uh, per your permit and you have a catastrophic rain event, which is a 25-year, 24-hour storm event, and and you discharge, well, and I can show you can show me through your records that you're applying when you should have and you pumped it down when you were supposed to and and done everything right. Well, then you get a you get an exemption from the EPA, and and. Uh, that's your permit as a shield. Um, here's a photo of lagoon maintenance. There's, you know, with all the tree, you got a whole grove of trees behind there. You can't get to the back of it. It looks like it's clear to the top of it. Uh, that that is an issue that uh, we would need to rectify. You know, location is everything. When you've got a uh, CAFO in an area that's that's directly on water versus one that you've uh, fenced off in the uh, and the animals can't get to water, you want to think about that. If, you're, if you've got two sites and one's got a great location, the other one's right next to water, you may, you may want to consider uh, consolidating into the one that's uh, in the right spot. This one here, you can see the water flows right through it. There's just, you can't beat Mother Nature. You, she, you're going to have to do something here to control that, and that's going to be a huge amount of water to control. It's another photo of that. You've got uh, facilities that are under roof. You know you've got to worry about your your feed as well as manure. A lot of times, loose hay will get knocked off a bale or silage, and it'll sit there. And then once enough water hits it, it'll degrade, and then, then that's processed wastewater. You've got to you've got to collect that stuff. When you see a I call it leachate coming off of uh, it can be feed. Uh, feedstock storage area, silage pile, hay, it can be uh, it, grain. You know, once it once it turns into that, now you've got a, a leachate that's just as bad to the water quality as any any manure. As you can see in this photo, now they've got a man-made conveyance. They've got a culvert, concrete culvert there that uh, allows the the convey. You know, puts it on a concrete pass and it goes right down to the water of the U.S. And that's what we're looking for. You know, and these photos that we're looking at, you know, they're available to, to everyone. We don't have a special satellite that gives us these great photos. Uh, they're on uh, GIS mapping. A lot of your colleges have a great uh, website for that. And also, you know, live search maps, Google Earth, Yahoo Maps. They, uh, that's what I use when I'm looking at facilities and trying to get a reference before I go out. Here's a dairy that uh, has... You know, everything's under roof, and you've got all that square footage from the roof line that you want to collect and get away from from the area so you don't have to to to, to manage it. So uh, the guttering and, and piping it away is the best way to do it. Here's another one where they've got, you can see the water is going around the lagoon or the holding pond, and they're diverting that uh, storm water so they don't have to use it or contaminate it and then have to uh, figure out a way to deal with it as processed wastewater. Here is, is obviously a catastrophic rain event, but you know, if he uphill from there, if he's got 15 or 20 acres that could have been diverted, you know, that's a lot of stormwater run on that you don't want to have to deal with. This here happens to be a catastrophic rain event that, it, you know, as long as he was doing uh, what he was supposed to be doing per his permit, he should get a pass on this. If not, then this could be construed as an illegal discharge. You know, the nutrient management plans are all coming into into play now, and and land.
land application is an important facet of it. Picking the right area for land application is, is also very important. Here's an irrigation pivot where you can apply effluent. However, this irrigation pivot goes over a natural drainage area. You'll see a lot of these up through Nebraska um, that they just put a bridge over the, the waterway and, and then they're irrigating directly into a natural drainage or waterway, which would be construed as, a, as an illegal discharge. There are setbacks for the uh, uh, proximity to waterways or bodies of water or wellheads or, or anything like that. So you always want to make sure that you take a look at your local state application there and, and see, because each one's different, you know, whether it's 100 feet, whether it's 30 feet. You can also put in permanent uh, grass or vegetative areas that will allow you to, to get closer, but, but um, you want to make sure that you're following your state guidelines and your best management practices and your permit. Um, and here's an example of where you can see where they've, where they've stopped short of the water to the right. Mortality management, uh, doing, con you know, some people, some places freeze it, some people uh, or places, facilities incinerate, um, and a lot of people do composting. Composting is an art. It's not, you know, you got to get it hot enough to break down the bad uh, microbes, but you don't want to get it too hot to where it kills the good bugs. So it's, it's uh, and that's, information is available at uh, online. You can, I think if you went online and typed in uh, mortality or composting or uh, animal composting, you can, there's a lot of studies been done on that as to how to do it. Uh, where you locate your composting, you want to make sure, you know, that's part of your process and it's got to be in an area that is, that is not, uh, that is controlled, so process wastewater that runs off of it needs to be controlled. This is not composting. Here's a guy, I got a few of these photos that, that uh, give good examples of what I would not consider to be composting. Um, although uh, this place here, they claimed that was composting, but it, but it was not. A lot of people use, or uh, facilities use burial. Um, and if you're doing that, you need to leave. I've, I've been to places where they'll have it half buried or they'll have trash in there too, or they'll dig a hole and put trash and, and then burn everything. Uh, burial is, is one way to do it, but you've got to follow the best management practices and follow the, follow the, the state guidelines. The, the composting you know, facilities, what happens is they'll, they'll build something new and they'll build a great little structure and they won't go back to their regulatory agency and they won't be part of the permit or they didn't get uh, somebody's advice on it and, and then the next thing you know they got a discharge from it. So you want to make sure that if you're going to change your facility and you're under a state operating permit or the, the federal uh, NPDES permit, make sure you communicate that with your agencies because they usually have some input or, or wants you to make some changes or update your, your information. And I'm waiting for that, that one to pull up. We'll see. Uh, I don't want to. If I click twice, then you miss the whole photo, so I've got to make myself not do that. Um, if you're staging, uh, uh, cleaning out your facility buildings, uh, whether it be litter buildings, whether it be uh, a concentrated animal feeding operation with uh, under buildings with cattle in it or, or hogs or, or whatnot, you got to put those open piles into areas that are in controlled areas. They can't be in an area that if a, a rain event comes up that they uh, run to a, a body of water. Uh, one thing I've come up with just a, a month ago was when you're when you're pushing snow. You know, it's, it's never always just snow. And even if you clean out the pins to where, uh, the open lots to where you can get the feed truck in there to where they don't pack down uh, and, and get a big ball of ice in there and you get some manure with it, you've got to pick a strategic spot so that, that those, when they start to melt, aren't in an uncontrolled area. I have run across that a couple times here just lately. Uh, silage. You know, silage, you know, the, is, is a great, here we go, and that's, uh, that's the one where uh, it, it ran down the hill and over the hill was uh, the body of water that I was talking about. Um, silage is just as bad, leachate from silage is just as bad to uh, water quality as, as any manure, solids, or, or liquids. And 
you know, the best way to do it is, is put it on the roof or get it covered and only have a minimum amount of working face open. And, and when, you know, the snow comes and you're scraping, housekeeping makes all the difference. You've got to keep your pile pushed up. You've got to keep your, your uh, there's another one. You've got to keep your pile pushed up. You've got to keep any, any liquid that's leaving off-site needs to be collected. And, uh, you know, a lot of times uh, people are feeding now distiller's grain, and that'll be pushed out and just dumped off, and it's kind of in a 90% in a or 70% uh, moisture as it is. So it doesn't take much rainwater to add to that to get it flowing and getting it to the ditch. And then once it gets to the ditch, it'll make it pretty quick to a, a body of water. And I'm almost done here. I'm trying to get to the end. But um, what I'm looking for, again, if I work closely with, with the state. So before I go out, you know, and a lot of times the state inspectors go with me. And like I said, they have, the, they have the program. They've usually been to the facility that I've been to. Uh, and so I, I get their insight and input as to what's going on there and get any updates as to, as to what specifically I need to be looking for other than the general items that we discussed today. And there's two photos here, but they're not coming up. There's one there, and that's just a close-up of the leachate from the, the from the silage pile. And that that there is it has a biological biological oxygen demand that that it far outweighs any manure that you see going into into a, a stream or river. It will it will kill fish just as quick as any nitrates or or E. coli or anything like that. That is all I have. Thank you.